A football team not scoring from the one yard line. Ben Simmons passing up an open layup and a wedding being called off right before I do. That's how the deferred WNBA expansion team in Portland has been described. Phew, oh my gosh. But <laughs> I have Sean Hyken here, author of the Rose Garden Report, who has been following this story from the very beginning here today to discuss the entire saga and what comes next. The Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast, it starts right now. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hello, happy Friday. Welcome. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm Jackie Powell, and I am one of your Friday hosts. Cover the New York Liberty at the next, which brings you this podcast six days a week. And I help with our social media strategy and have covered the WNBA nationally at many other places. But anyway, I want to thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember that Locked on women's basketball is brought to you by everyone at the next, a place where we cover women's basketball all the time. And we tell the stories that need to be told every day. Subscribe now to support the staff at The Next. That works oh so hard. It's $9 a month or $72 for the year. Also, we have been breaking records here at Locked on Women's Basketball. We continue to grow each month in our listens. And that is thanks to you, dear listener. Remember, Locked on Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. This episode is brought to you all by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use the code, all lowercase, LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. So, the last time you and I were together, dear listener, I had my three Anand Faraman of Defector on to discuss the new coaches embarking on the WNBA and former playing legend Teresa Weatherspoon and NBA assistant Nate Tibbetts. But since then, there has been some major drama that we ought to discuss And that's in regard to WNBA expansion and how at the 11th 11th hour, the W deferred Portland an expansion team. So our roadmap for today with my expert on Portland, all things Portland basketball pretty much, in Sean is in segment one, we're going to sort of provide the, the Portland WNBA origin story. How did we get to a point where Portland was at the one yard line? Segment two, we're going to talk about how exactly this all fall, fell apart with all the, the reporting and all these pieces of the story that are now coming together. And then in segment three, we're going to discuss what questions and problems does this deferral pose for the future of not only a Portland expansion team, but the future of the WNBA and the league at large. So, Sean, thank you so much for taking the time. Let's just start with reminding the listeners about how Portland really got into the fold here in the first place. Well, so, for Jackie, thanks for having me on. But uh, Portland has had a WNBA team before. They had the fire for three seasons from 2000 to 2002. And so this was pretty close to the beginning of the WNBA's existence when maybe they, I think, I think, and you know, I was, I was a kid when this was going on. So obviously I don't have like the firsthand knowledge of, you know, the business stuff, but 
it seems to me like at the beginning the WNBA kind of expanded too fast and added too many teams too early and you you know you saw some of those teams end up folding and the fire was one of those three teams and they actually at the time they had more than 8000 fans a game which at the time was one of the best in the league as far as attendance but this was during the time when cuz okay so at the beginning of the you you probably know more about this than I do but I just you know I just know what I've read in the process of you know reporting out this new Portland expansion stuff over the last year or two but uh at the beginning of the WNBA's existence the teams weren't owned by an by you know individual owners they were all owned by the league office and they were assigned to you know sister franchises with NBA teams and so the Portland Fire were assigned to the Blazers and you know, so Paul Allen, who was the Blazers' owner at the time, who passed away about five or six years ago, uh, was the chairman of the Portland Fire, but he didn't actually own the team. And then in 2002, the league voted to revert ownership of the individual teams back to the NBA franchises that they were tied to in their markets. And so those te- those owners could either, you know, keep running them, which in some cases, like the Indiana Fever and the Minnesota Lynx, and I, I guess the-, the-, the Phoenix Mercury would be another one. But some of those, you know, those NBA teams decided to keep running the uh, WNBA teams. Some team or some teams actually just sold them to, you know, outside owners. And some teams just decided to fold them. And Paul Allen decided at the time to, because the Blazers also weren't doing very well financially at the time. And this was in the early 2000s when, NBA teams were not worth nearly as much money as they are now, and that wasn't nearly as profitable a business as it was now. He decided to just fold the fire. So that's why the fire stopped existing. It wasn't because of a lack of fan interest. And so in the 20 years since then, Portland has become just this huge, you know, hotbed for women's sports in general. The Thorns in the NWSL routinely lead that league in attendance. I think this past year they were dethroned but for the last 10 years or nine years or however long the league has existed the thorns have been one of if not the most well-attended teams in the league they play the same stadium that the timbers play at and they sell it out and so you know there's there's a big you know there's a high level of local interest there and the oregon and oregon state women's basketball programs at the college level are also very popular here and very successful and so there's been a thought that now that the wnba might be looking at expansion again that Portland would be a logical fit because they, you know, the fan interest is there. The Blazers are very popular here, so it's a big basketball uh, city. The Blazers own the arena, and so, you know, there's a place that they could play, obviously, in the summer. And it was just a matter of, you know, was there an ownership group that was willing to, you know, step up and pay the, you know, the expansion fee and, you know, put the money into it to make it successful. And, the guy that had been kind of proposed to be the owner of the team is this guy named Kirk Brown, who is based in Vancouver, Washington, which is a suburb about 20 miles out of Portland. And he's the co-founder of a company called Zoom Info, which was like, it's, 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 it's one of the, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they do, but it's, it's one of those companies that like takes like data on people and like sells it to businesses. It's like that. It's like that type of thing. That's where his money came from. I don't know the exact ins and outs of it, but it's like some, something in that realm of like business tech software analytics, something in that, in that realm. But like, that's where his money is coming from. And he is apparently, I don't know the guy at all. I've met him once, but he apparently is just a huge WNBA fan. He lives in Las Vegas part-time. He's an Aces season ticket holder and he just wanted to have this team as a toy to spend money on. And he was really all in on, like, I'll spend whatever on getting it to, you know, pay, paying whatever I have to pay for the expansion fee. I'm going to spend money on the team. I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to build a practice facility. All this stuff that you would want from an owner of an expansion team in a league like the WNBA that's trying to grow. He was going to run the team the way that, like, Mark Davis runs the Aces or Joe Side runs the Liberty, where they just spend a ton of money on it and try to make it first class. That was kind of the selling point, and and at the eleventh hour a couple weeks ago, he just kind of decided not to do it anymore. He decided, to, and we can get into why, but that's uh, well later in the show. But that's kind that's kind of where it where it all evolved, and you know, I think for all the reasons I laid out, I think the WNBA kind of circled Portland as with the amount of interest that there is in women's sports and the arena situation being pretty favorable, this is 
exactly the kind of market that would check the boxes for, you know, a place they would want to expand to. And it seemed like they had everything in place. Like I was told a date for a press conference to announce it that I had been keeping empty on my calendar because I was told that there was a day that they were going to announce it. Like, that's how done it was. I, I had somebody connected to Nike, like, in August, tell me that Weidman Kennedy had a campaign ready to go for the rollout. So, like, it was obviously not a done deal because we're sitting here talking about why a WNBA team in Portland isn't happening rather than talking about a Portland WNBA team happening. But the analogy that you used above about something being at the one-yard line, it was as close to a done deal as something could possibly be without actually getting done. I can't help but sigh. Um, I, I appreciate that full rundown. I, I think the one thing I want to ask you before we cut to a break and then head into segment two, sort of talking about how this all fell apart. Uh-huh. I just sort of want to know when there was that very public moment where Kathy Engelbert came to Portland. Right. Mm-hmm. And she yeah. has that panel at the sports bra. Can you just tell me, I guess, what was significant about that moment when that was and, and how that sort of mattered when it came to how serious uh, the WNBA and Kathy Engelbert and the league office about Portland? So that event was, what is, where are we in now? November. So that would have been, so this is February. So that was nine months ago. I was actually there. And so, first of all, the fact that it was at the sports bra, which I, you know, some of your listeners may know about because it's had some national features done on it. But for those who don't know, it's, and this is kind of a radical concept, a sports bar that only airs women's sports on TV. That's the concept of the bar. And I'll admit the only time I've been there was for that event, but I know people who go there, you know, often. And apparently, the business that it does during Thorns matches or Women's World Cup matches or, you know, big call it, you know, NCAA tournament games or you know things like that it's like impossible to get a table during events like that and so the fact that there is an establishment like that that is not only open but doing the kind of business that apparently it's doing is I mean that's just another thing that would make you think okay this is an ideal you know market for a WNBA team to expand into if there's enough of an interest in you know that type of a sports bar that you know that 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 thing is so successful that you know you would think that that's going to you know lead to there being enough interest in a WNBA team but as far as that event uh it was kind of a who's who of Oregon sports not just on the like obviously like some of the like Kelly Graves the head coach of the uh Oregon women's basketball team and Scott Ruick the head coach of the Oregon State women's basketball team and uh the GM of the Portland Thorns were there but also on the panel, it was a whole bunch of people from Blazers League. So it was Kathy Engelbert, and it was hosted by Ron Wyden, who's Oregon's uh, senior U.S. senator, has been in the Senate for decades. And the people, and it was like a bunch of Blazers executives. It was Joe Crone and the general manager, Dwayne Hankins, the president of business operations, and two of the three former WNBA players who are in the Blazers front office, Asia Jones, who is their kind of salary cap person, and Cherie Sam, who is their scouting manager, they were all on this thing. Basically, they were they all just kind of went around in a circle and like gave the pitch to Kathy Engelbert and gave her the sell as to this is why Portland is the perfect city for a WNBA team. And like they brought a couple of like middle school girls basketball teams there to just be in the audience and cheer. And like they put up signs and it was, I mean, it was, it, it kind of felt like a campaign rally or like a pep rally, but that type of collection of people who are very powerful in the sports industry in the state of Oregon all being in one place with a U.S. senator running it. I I think that is a pretty compelling pitch that you can make to the commissioner of a league. And then, you know, that day she, you know, she went to the Blazer game that night and, you know, toured the facility. And that was all part of the information gathering about it, which, you know, we we can get into if you want all the stuff with the arena that was, Mm -hmm. you know, that they're saying is what fell through. But that happened nine months ago. So, like, she has seen the arena. She has seen... You know, this this idea that it was this, you know, this last minute thing that those issues came up doesn't really hold water. But that event from a public, you know, perception standpoint was huge in terms of the, uh, you know, the viability of it. Just that many people in one room telling her to, uh, you know, the, this is why you should do this. This is why Portland would be perfect. This is what we have to offer to the league. And Kirk Brown was there. He was not on the panel. 
And that, that was the one time I met him. I just, like, introduced myself to him briefly. He didn't want to do any interviews because I think he wanted to kind of keep a low profile publicly until the thing was done done for, you know, reasons that we've kind of seen over the last couple of weeks. But he was there. And, I don't know, it was to me it was a really successful event. And clearly it, at least in some way, contributed to accomplishing what they wanted to accomplish because until he decided to pull out at the last minute, it was pretty much a done deal that Portland was going to get a team. Yeah, I mean, that's... It's so fascinating that you use the term. It was it was almost like a pep rally. Um, and it's interesting you say that because I actually asked Sabrina Ionescu, who, mm-hmm. as you all know, she had a historic career at Oregon, and mm-hmm. she did a clinic for her newly rolled out foundation. She did a clinic um, in Eugene. And so I sort of asked her, I said, you know, what was the energy at that clinic when it came to the young people that are, that are into women's basketball, that are into sports, that are into basketball. And she was like, yeah, you know, the energy was great. There were more people at this clinic than there were at other clinics I had done. So it just, that just reaffirms that this market, this area is, is, is ready for this. And so We're going to take a quick break, but in the next segment, we're going to talk about how this all fell apart, um, which we know some about, but boy, anyway, I want to talk to you all about our friends at Jace Medical and what they do. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the world today. There is unrest in the Middle East. There's na- there are natural disasters around the United States and, and more. And these all can lead to supply chain shortages for medications or the inability to get the, me- the meds that you need in a timely manner. And so don't be unprepared. Your health is wealth, but there's a solution. The Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life savings meds based on you and your family's unique needs. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery, and ongoing consultation and care. You can even buy a gift card for family or your loved ones so that they can get a Jace case of their own. Go to jacemedical.com and enter the code LOCKEDON at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code LOCKEDON at jacemedical.com. Thank you, Jace Medical. And health is wealth, folks. We, Sean and I can't do what we do without being healthy. So we encourage you all to take care of your health. It's important. Anyway, let's return to our discussion about the WNBA in Portland But before that, we just want to thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Tomorrow, our WNBA draft and pro player development scouting crew are back. Uh, They are going to be talking about what they've seen from some of the best WNBA prospects in college. So you don't want to miss that tomorrow. So, Sean, I guess I should start with a simple question. How did this all fall apart? I think what we're learning as, you know, the the dust sort of settles from what's happened over the last couple of weeks is that Kirk Brown, who I talked about before and was going to be the owner of the WNBA expansion team at the last minute or for whatever reason, just kind of uh, decided, you know, he that it wasn't actually something he wanted to do. And there's Things that have been reported, uh, my, my colleague and friend Bill Orem at the Oregonian has had a lot of reporting about, you know, they there was disagreements that he had with the league office over what they wanted to call the team and some of the branding. And then, you know, one of his 
uh, ownership interests in a youth basketball gym that may have been a conflict. The part that, to me, not enough people are talking about is, and I'm looking at this right now, I have it in front of me, Zoom Info, his company, their stock price has fallen by 55% over the last year. So, you know, a year or so ago when he was talking about, you know, like, oh, this is, this is, you know, this is my passion project. I want to do this. I'm going to spend all this money on, you know, investing in the team and making it a first class product and I'll pay whatever. He might just not have it like that anymore. And that, you know, that's, that, that's what made the league's response to it so interesting that they tried to pin it on the, you know, the Blazers arena renovation stuff, which we can go into if you want to, but, uh, when really the reason that it fe- that it uh, it fell apart was not because of you know the Blazers and their plans to renovate the Moda Center, but it was it seems like it was because either Kirk Brown c- couldn't or decided he didn't want to spend the money on it anymore, and so he pulled out. And that it seems it seems like that's really more why it was than any of the stuff that was put out there by the league at the time. So I think it's important for the listeners to understand what the Blazers' role in all of this was. Because Uh I think that's something that isn't really, um, I guess, on the surface of all of this. So if you could explain that, I think that would be helpful. So the Blazers were not going to be the owners of the WNBA team. And I don't even think they could if they wanted to, because, you know, and I'll, I'll I'll try to be as surface level as I can with this and not get too far in the weeds, but... The Blazers are currently in a trust because their owner, Paul Allen, died in 2018, so about five years ago. And his sister, Jody, he wasn't married, he didn't have kids, and so his sister, Jody, is the one that's kind of overseeing the trust. And there's terms in the trust that say that all of his assets at some point have to be sold and the money has to go to whatever charities he designated it to. So it's, that's been a whole thing here locally because at some point the Blazers are going to ha- have to be sold. And, you know, Phil Knight has made a very public effort to buy the team and that that's a that's a thing that's going to get sorted out over the next several years I don't think it's going to happen imminently but because of you know how complex the trust is and how uh you know it's still being unwound and they have to sell all of his assets I don't think the Blazers could under their current ownership could own the WNBA team even if they wanted to because of just the way that the you know the trust is being unwound and they're gonna have to sell the stuff eventually I don't think they would want to add more stuff to the collection of, of, of assets, I guess. But with that being said, the Blazers do own the Moda Center. And when you own an arena like that, your goal is to have as many dates in the year filled as possible. And so what is the WNBA regular season? 40 games? Yes. <laughs> so if you have a WNBA team playing in the arena that you own, that's 20 dates a year in the summer that are guaranteed to be filled. And so the Blazers were very on board with the idea of, you know, there being a WNBA team, even though they weren't going to be actually involved in the ownership group, uh, their, you know, people at their ownership level were helping Kirk Brown get interviews with the league office or get meetings with the league office about it, introducing him to potential corporate sponsors. And when it comes to the arena renovation stuff, they really, they actually look kind of changed what their timeline is for that stuff in order to make it easier for a WNBA team to potentially play there. Cause so the way I, and again, this is like the most surface level way of explaining this without getting so deep into the details on the arena stuff. But there are three summers worth of renovations that have to get done to the arena to modernize it really and make it, you know, totally up to date. One of them was just done this past summer. So two more summers worth of work has to be done on the arena And it has to be done by 2030 because that year Portland is announced as the host city for the women's final four. So that's a hard deadline. It absolutely has to be done by then when you're having a big national event like that come to town. Like it has to get done by 2030. And it's just a matter of which two summers between now and 2030 they do the rest of the renovations. And the Blazers, I think, originally planned to do it in either 25 and 26 or 26 and 27. But... Because if the idea of a, of a WNBA team starting there in 25, they were willing to say, look, we will, because they wanted this to happen, they were, they were willing to say, look, we will uh, defer, you know, our, 
our you know the, our renovations we will be so that if you start in 25 you can play your first two seasons in 25 and 26 in the moda center and then we'll do the renovations in 27 and 28 and you might have to play a couple of seasons at the memorial coliseum which is right next door to the moda center that's where the blazers used to play from when they started in 1970 until 1995 when the moda center opened it's like a 60 year old building it's it's still up they still have like concerts and we have a minor league hockey team that plays there so like they still use the arena for some stuff it's still kind of up but it's a very 60 year old arena it's not at all up to date and there were going to be some renovations that had to be done to that too not as not as extensive as the stuff with the moda center but like in order for a wnba team to play there for a couple of seasons there were going to be some updates to the locker rooms there that would have to be done in order to make those kind of up to the standard of you know what a professional sports team should have as a locker room amenities in 2023 and it was not going to cost that much money to do it it was like i i check i don't know the exact number but i was told it was a seven figure amount it's like a single digit millions of dollars so for somebody who's owning a team it's not that much extra money to have to spend for you know a couple of years worth of you know updates if that if your team is going to have to play there and by the way the blazers do not own the coliseum they the city of portland owns the coliseum so somebody else would have had to pay for the renovations to the coliseum because the blazers don't own that building they own the moda center they're paying for all the stuff at the moda center but they don't own the coliseum so kirk brown likely would have had to pay for that stuff but the more important thing is this stuff was all known by the wnba this stuff has all been out there publicly for over a year like they the blazers announced their whole renovation project around a year ago if not like a little more than a year ago i don't have the exact timeline in front of me but it's been known it's been just common knowledge publicly this is not like breaking news that happened that which is why which is why the the way that the kathy engelbert's letter to senator wyden that was uh kind of publicized that was the you know the reason that they uh decided not to pursue expansion in portland was so baffling to a lot of people was it's not like these issues with you know the timing of the arena renovations just came up now and they're just finding out about it now this is all stuff that they've known about and like i said when she came here for the you know event at the sports bra she toured the building and she toured the coliseum like they've been talking about this stuff for almost a year like they like they've been working through all this stuff you know in you know for for, se for several months internally and you know between the team and the league office and Kirk Brown like they've been talking about this stuff for a long time everybody has kind of known mm -hmm. that this stuff was all going to come into play and if anything the Blazers have gone out of their way to change what their plans were as far as the schedule of what you know what summers they were going to do the renovations in order to make it easier for a WNBA team to play there like I said earlier they want a WNBA team to play in their arena because that fills 20 dates a year and it's also just good for them from a business standpoint to have some marketing synergy between the Blazers and the because the Blazers have a huge fan base and you know you could think that some of those people will probably also be interested in going to WNBA games in the summer but like they their their stance the whole time on it has been both to the WNBA and to Kirk Brown. Whatever you guys need to help make this happen, we got you. Like, that's been their stance the whole time, which is why I think a lot of people in the organization... Are confused. First of all, first of all, the Blazers found out that the Portland WNBA expansion wasn't going to happen when Kurt, when uh, Kathy Engelbert wrote that letter to Ron Wyden. They, the organization was totally blindsided by it. Like, they, they didn't get a heads up about it. I, I was told that. And they were also, I think a lot of people in that, in that organization, like at the management and ownership level, were confused about like why she was using their arena renovation stuff as the reason for it not to happen when really what happened was Kirk Brown, whether it was because his company's lost a ton of money in the last year or he just decided it wasn't something he wanted to do anymore or whatever the case may be. Again, I don't know Kirk Brown at all. We haven't heard from him since this started, so I don't actually know where his head is at, but him deciding not to do it anymore is the reason this thing fell apart because again i was told in august that nike and wyden and kennedy had a rollout campaign ready to go and there was a date in october i think it was the 23rd like the 26th i think it, we, like it was supposed to be the 23rd and then it was the 26th but there were specific dates that were told to me as far as like this is when an announcement is going to be that like that like it was so close to done that you know it didn't just you know, they didn't get as far along as they did, and then 
suddenly at the 11th hour, Kathy Engelbert said, oh, you know what? I actually just found out this stuff that's been public record for over a year about what time, what, what years they're going to do the arena renovations. I, like, that just doesn't really hold up. I am here to talk to you all about prize picks with the NBA and the college basketball season being here, and that's both women's and men's, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League. It's a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James and Travis Kelsey and Caitlin Clark at a 10 and a half combo of three points made and receptions. Want to play alongside some of Prize Pick's favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schulz? You can now find community plays under the promo tabs of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So, tonight, freshman sensation Juju Watkins and the USC Trojans play FGCU at 10 p.m. Eastern. How many points will she score? Make those predictions with prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Well, it was clearly based on the other reporting that has come out following the letter. It was a cop out. Uh, she did not really want to say what actually was happening. And I think you and I have spoken about this off air, that it's sort of a weird decision and it's maybe not a smart one to pin this on or or blame this on the Blazers. And I I think what's most confusing to me are the, the reasons for Kirk Brown deciding he didn't want to do it anymore. I've heard some rumblings that there there was sort of a a clash of egos here. I mean, the league office wanted to be more involved when it came to the branding. I am still trying to figure out why Rose City royalty caused so much upheaval. It's not a name I would choose, and maybe the reason here, and you can add to this too, but the, the Portland Thorns... That's the NWSL team. I just wonder, does the league office want to make sure that the WNBA team has some separation from that and that it's not all lumped together and it doesn't get confused? That was the thought that I had. Um, And then I do want to mention the the Shoot 360, which is his – I guess it's a a training facility across the country that he's invested in. I do see a potential conflict of interest there just because I was looking on the site. There's a Warriors basketball academy that apparently is a shoot 360 location. So I, I mean, the 13th expansion team is the WNBA in, in Golden State. I'm assuming that may drive some of what's a conflict of interest here. But even that, it, it doesn't seem super clear what's going on there with those those two contention points between Kirk Brown and the league. Yeah, I think both of those are also... You, you talked about Kathy using the arena thing and the renovations as a cop-out. I kind of feel like both of those are cop-outs also. Like, Ooh. first of all, so, so, so I agree with... Like, to me, this is just my personal opinion. Rose City Royalty is a terrible name. Like, it's not it's not one I would personally choose. Like, why would they not just bring back the Portland Fire? There's nostalgia here around that. It's a good name. They had a good logo. I still see people 
in town, like, when I'm just out and about, I see people wearing, like, fire shirts, and, like, I see their stuff for sale at vintage stores. Like, they can bring back, like, even though it would be a new franchise with a new ownership group, like, they can, like, pretend to have a franchise history and fold in, like, the old franchise records from the fire from, like, like Jackie Styles or whatever. Like, they could do, like, they, like, it's, to me, it's such, like, just like how... Whenever Seattle gets an NBA team back, which is going to happen in a couple of years, they're going to be the Sonics again, I'm pretty sure, because there's so much nostalgia around that, and it's so iconic. And even though the Portland Fire only existed here for three years, 20 years ago, they were very popular, and they did they were one of the better attended teams in the league. So I don't know why you wouldn't just go with the Portland Fire again. But even besides that, I don't know what they thought. Of, like, like, I've seen the reporting about, like, they didn't like the connotations of royalty, and, like, I guess, I, mean, I don't know. I mean... I just don't think it's a very good name, and it's just not a name I would choose. But I also, and you know more about this than I do because you cover the WNBA regularly. I do not like that just about every WNBA team has a singular name. Like, I just, I don't like singular names. So that's, <laughs> I, that, that, that's just my own personal preference, though. That's not, I don't, I don't know what was actually problematic about it, but I didn't like the name personally when I saw that that was what the, and, and as far as the Shoot 360 thing, I guess I can see how they might feel like ha an owner owning some youth basketball gyms across the country, and maybe there's some business affiliation with the Warriors. I guess I can see how, but like these, the world of like sports and sports business and, you know, sports, you know, owners, it's all so incestuous and they all have so much business with each other and with different companies that do business with the league. Like I'll, like I'll give you an example that's maybe a little lower level than some of the obvious stuff, but the guy who bought the Utah jazz a few years ago, uh, Ryan Smith made his money from starting a, a business analytics company called Qualtrics. And back when they were first starting to let us as media go to games in person again, during the pandemic, we had to upload our vaccination info to a database that the league was was rolling out. I'm sure you had to do that also on the WNBA mm -hmm. side. What was the company whose software was powering that system? Qualtrics. So, um, and it's just like that, that stuff is just like, there's only so many like rich guys who own these companies and they all like, like Phil Knight wants to buy the Blazers and Nike is the league's apparel partner. Is that a conflict? I don't know. On Sunday, Sean and I will be back to discuss how Phil Knight fits into all of this. Or does he? Also, we'll discuss how the WNBA only having one expansion franchise could lead to some huge problems. Could the Golden State WNBA team become the W's version of the NHL's Golden Knights? There is some concern there. But we want to thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And I want to give a huge thank you to Sean for hopping on the show today. Follow him at Hyken, that's his last name, that's H-I-G-H-K-I-N. Follow him there on all of the interwebs and read his work at www.rosegardenreport.com. And tune in tomorrow for our WNBA draft and pro player development scouting crew. They'll be back to discuss what they've made of the pro prospects playing in their first week of college ball this week. And also stay tuned for Sunday, where we'll be back with part two. Have a wonderful Friday, everyone. Jackie Powell, signing off. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.